Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we have a lot of information to, to share with you. I'm really curious to hear back from you uh, in response to what you hear from us. Um, there, is, there are some clementines and bottles of water over there. That needs that. Uh, restrooms are just out here to the left. We want a little short hallway there as well. Um, Nick Gosling is with the Carson School, and uh, he's our um, communications and media um, support tech assistant, expert specialist. Uh, he's going to just video this. We're going to document this process so commissions work. Um, when the commission itself meets, um, of course, those are all uh, documented, but we thought this offset meeting. Of you all, but would also be important to document um, as we build the story of, of how it is that we're going to address the challenges that the commission has been handed by the, by the legislature. Uh, if you prefer not to have your, uh, uh, any still photographs taken or you're facing any video that gets shared, uh, please let Nick or me know if you're in the witness protection program. <laughs> <laughs> if you, oh, that's why that person was. Um, let us know, I'm serious. Um, let's start though with introductions. I know that a lot of you work with each other on a regular basis, um, but let's just um, go around a bit to make sure we all know each other. Um, all of my name tags, um, so it's up to you to learn your names and put names and faces as we go around. So if you would just share your name, uh, the town you live in these days, uh, and the hat that you're wearing, at least in the, at this afternoon's meeting, and any other hats that you wear that um, you think you'd like to share with the rest of us as well. Um, so, um, Liz will start. Sure. So, I'm Liz Canada. I live in Exeter. Um, the hat that I'm wearing professionally today is I'm the Director of Policy and Practice at Rich and Higher Adventure. I also serve on Exeter's Budget Recommendations Committee, which is a little bit of mm -hmm. I'm Jerry Zellin. I'm a lawyer. Um, I work in Portsmouth, as we all think of Drummond Wilson. I live in Portsmouth. I uh, specialize in representing school districts, particularly in matters involving student rights, and a lot of the work I do involves special education. And I'm here today on a volunteer basis to um, work with the New Hampshire Association of Special Education Administrators to discuss special education issues. Uh, I'm Jordan Hensley. I live in Dover. Uh, I'm a policy analyst at the Carson School of Public Policy, and I'm part of the team supporting the commission. Uh, I'm Doug Hall. I live in Chichester outside of Concord. And uh, I guess the other thing is, I was the author of the bill to create a commission. I'm Carrie Portry. I work with New Hampshire Listens. I'm a team member with Carsey on the commission. I'm also a doctoral candidate in education at the Yes, I'm Oh, yes, and I'm family yeah. to Dover. <laughs> Hello, I'm Sarah Robinson. I'm a new addition to Reaching Higher New Hampshire. I am the uh, senior project manager there, and I actually live about five blocks that way. So, this is delightful. <laughs> uh, I'm Dal Zanchuk. I'm a member of the commission. Um, I also serve as the board chair of the New Hampshire Learning Initiative. Um, I'm on the SB 190 CT advisory uh, commission with the, uh, uh, the Department of Education. And uh, that's enough. I live in Concord. I'm Dr. Jennifer Dahl. I live in Brookline, New Hampshire. I was director of special ed in Nashua and Manchester, and currently director of special ed in Gosstown and Boston. I also did um, my dissertation on education funding in New Hampshire in particular, so I have some interest in it, and I know which all is. I'm Jane Bergeron, and I'm a resident of Litchfield, New Hampshire, um, and I am here representing um, two hats, the New Hampshire Association of Special Ed Administrators. I also serve on the Commission for School Funding. I'm Barry Christina, Executive Director of the New Hampshire School Boards Association. We represent um, about 160 school boards and about 100, about 700 school board members statewide. And I also live in Dover, so if you want to have our next meeting there, I'll spark you around. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Brian Hawkins, uh, I live in Concord, and uh, I'm the Government Relations Director at NEA New Hampshire. We represent uh, about 17,000 educators uh, in state collective bargaining. So, looking forward to being here today. Uh, Greg Bird, third member of 
reaching higher New Hampshire uh, at the table, um, senior data analyst and the fourth resident of Dover, New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Michael Termel. I live in Concord, New Hampshire. I have about 27 years in education in New Hampshire, the last 21 in SAUs 24 and 17, most recently San Juan Regional School District. For the last year, I've worked at the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation as the Director of Education and Career Initiatives, um, and I'm deeply interested in this topic. Uh, Fred Bermazzi, former chair of the New Hampshire State Board of Education. I'm the president of the National Center for Competency-Based Learning. I'm here representing the New Hampshire Coalition for Business and Education, and this subject is very near and dear to my heart. In uh, in 1990 <clears throat> something, uh, myself and two others won the Josiah Bartlett Better Government Award for our um, for our concept uh, uh, called. Uh, uh, a flat tax on property to fund an adequate education in New Hampshire public schools, and uh, uh, it is the direction that the uh, that the uh, legislature ultimately went down, but they still messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Becky Forsall. I'm a uh, resident of Hanover, New Hampshire, and I currently am the director of student services for the Hopkinton School District. Um, I'm not sure which hat I'm wearing today, probably a couple of different ones. I'm currently the co-chair of the Legislative Committee for the New Hampshire Association of Special Administrators. And in July, I'll be moving into the Director of Government Relations position for the New Hampshire School Boards Association. So I'm here on multiple fronts. Um, I'm Jane Brady. I'm in Fort Smith, New Hampshire. Um, this is the City Attorney, uh, Ian Gertzman. And I'm a staff liaison for the Legislative Select Committee who is tracking the commission and we're coming up to speed with this very complex topic and trying to uh, learn uh, about this particular topic and, the, and follow the commission's uh, charge as far as the education issue. As you well know, of course, it's a former donor town um, and the uh, issues relate to, to you know, the former donor town is something that there used to be a coalition uh, of communities uh, that has not been active over the last several years, but um, there is information sharing uh, between you know the city of Portsmouth and other former donors on this issue. Thanks, and Rogers, can you um, can you hear me? I'm not sure why we're still not hearing you. Um, I'll, I'll say Rogers Johnson is with us, obviously on the line. Uh, he's a resident. He's, he's a resident of the Seacoast. He uh, wasn't able to come to be here because he's under commitment right after this meeting. Uh, many of you know Rogers. Uh, he's the, uh, the president of the Seacoast NAACP and also the chair of the Governor's Council on Diversity and Inclusion, which is a working group last year. And I wanted to include uh, representation from the council and Rogers, uh, because as you may know, a number of the recommendations that the Governor's Council on Diversity and Inclusion uh, landed on so far have focused on public schools and the preparation of public school teachers to be prepared to serve um, students, uh, all students in our schools, including students of color, uh, newcomers to our state and uh, uh, part of the new uh, of our state. So um, I hope that Rogers can at least hear us. Um, give us a thumbs up <clears throat> or send you a note on email that he's tuned in. Um, <clears throat> you have a, a sort of one page information sheet in front of you that is our general um, description of what this is all about. Um, a number of you, of course, are uh, veterans of um, this topic. Um, uh, I guess I should say I'm Bruce Mallory. <laughs> um, sometimes I hesitate to say what my hometown is because I can be accused of being a carpet bagger. These days, I live in Kerry Park, Maine. Um, I've lived in the Seacoast for the last 40 some years. Uh, I'm a professor emeritus now at the University of New Hampshire, where I've been for 41 years um, as a faculty member, professor of education, uh, background as a 
junior high school, and those that last money are called junior high schools, as you know. Social studies teacher um, in Cleveland, Ohio, in a really challenged um, neighborhood. Uh, most of my students were students of color, about 98%. Um, this was in the early 70s, and um, they were facing significant challenges then, and, and still are. In New Hampshire, uh, when I came to New Hampshire, I worked as a VISTA volunteer in Pembroke, Allenstown, the Sunnycliffe area. I was director of Head Start programs in Long Island and Merrimack counties, um, and then joined the uh, UNH faculty in 1979, where I've worn a variety of hats as a faculty member, as a university leader. Uh, founded with my colleague Michelle Old Shannon in New Hampshire Listens 10 years ago this year, and for a while was interim director of the Farsi Institute as it made the transition to the first school of public policy. Um, and so, um, and I, I'm about a fifth generation, some of the people um, for New Hampshire, even though I've lived here 41 years, I'm still from the way. Um, <laughs> said, um, and, and, and homes in Gilmerton, New Hampshire, for, since the late 19th century, actually. Um, so in any case, welcome again. Uh, <laughs> In the, in the last spring and summer and fall, as the legislature was grappling with, um, the, once again, school funding issue, and particularly was confronting the challenges that were being faced by a number of our districts um, relative to the way that the stabilization formula uh, was being phased out, and those districts were facing shrinking enrollments, and those districts um, um, did not do not have the uh, proper resources um, to make up the difference um, in terms of the shrinking state appropriations. So the legislature was trying to um, consider what its long-term solutions might be. As you know, it arrived at at least some short-term solutions for the current um, Bennett Biennium that has, in a sense, protected, I would use my word, has protected those districts that were at risk for really significant financial exigency uh, because of the way the funding formula and their enrollments were playing out. Yeah, um, short story, um, in 1996, I think it was, when I was chair of the Department of Education at UNH and doing a lot of statewide public education work, um, I served on Governor Shadoon's Schools Council at that time. A couple of people who you know um, came to me in 1996. Mel Myler, wearing his NEA hat at the time. And then the woman who was the executive director of the NHS the School Boards Association, Judith, help me with her last name. School Board? School Board Association. Judy Reaver. Yeah. Judy Reaver, thank you. She was president. I think she was executive president. Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, came to me together uh, and said, is there anything the university could do to help communities hold um, in their words, safe spaces for conversations around local education. If you remember at that time in the mid and late 90s, our school boards were um, places of the really challenging environments for conducting public meetings. Um, in a number of our communities, uh, well-organized uh, Christian coalition voting blocks had succeeded in gaining majorities on local school boards. And when they did, they took actions that I think um, surprised and got the attention of uh, local residents and school administrators relative to school budgets, but also curriculum around things like reproductive health, evolution, references in literature to gay and lesbian lifestyles. Uh, and so at that time, um, public schools and school boards, and of course, this was just before Claremont won as well, um, became places where uh, people were literally yelling at each other and threatening each other. 60 Minutes, you may or may not know, they had a special on Merrimack, New Hampshire, showing what these school boards were like. <laughs> um, local law enforcement had to escort school board members in and out of the meetings because they were being threatened, carrying out their volunteer public service activities. So Mel and Judith came and said, can the university provide a neutral and safe space for folks to have conversations about School, school matters, public school matters. And I said, sure, of course we can. That's what our, our mission should be as, a, as the public land grant university for the state. I had no idea what that meant or what that was like, <laughs> but, I, but it's, it struck me as something really important to do. 
uh, and with the support of our then university president, John Leitzel, we, we began something called the Public School the Public Conversation Project, focused on public education. And I designed a set of statewide conversations on, guess what, on adequacy. What do we mean by adequacy? So that's what we're right now doing on this. Um, and that led to a lot of public engagement work that then led me to several years ago start New Hampshire Listens. Um, I, I, one missing piece of that is I'll, I'll mention in 1975 and 6, I was a part time staffer for the House Education Committee in Congress. And I was assigned essentially two tasks in 75, 76, so 40 some years ago. Uh, uh, do policy analysis and write um, proposed legislation on getting public kindergarten statewide in the state, and then uh, do something about how we fund our schools. Um, and actually, uh, the kindergarten bill only 25 years later. Right, and the other one was through. The other one was through. And that's actually the game of progress. So, so, in any case, that um, I, I say all that simply by the way of letting you know a little bit about um, what I bring to this, the lens I bring to it, uh, and my commitment to helping the legislature. Uh, and through this current iteration of trying to address the problem, with I think as the rest of us with a realistic eye to the challenges around this, uh, at the same time an optimism um, about this particular effort. Uh, this 16-person commission uh, listed on the back of the uh, one page that you have, as you as you know, is made up of elected representatives and senators, and also public members. Uh, Jane being one of those. Um, and Bell, uh, who um, have a wonderful mix of expertise and perspectives and histories and uh, hats that they wear um, relative to public education in New Hampshire. And we've met now four or so times, I guess. With, uh, and I, I'll just say that I think that the tenor of these meetings so far has been very constructive. Um, and yes, uh, individual members of the commission have their own ideas about how to what the eventual recommendations might be back to the legislature. They have their own perspectives, their own experience. And and um, I think they all these folks come to the table uh, ready to listen to each other, um, to do the uh, research and analysis that needs to be done, uh, and to try to arrive at one or more policy recommendations do back to the state legislature in December um, to try to help the state move forward uh, on this really huge challenge. So that's a little bit about um, the legislature. We have this we have this charge. I think I sent you the charge initially when I invited you, you know, to this meeting. You're familiar with that. The hats that you wear, all of you are paying close attention, I'm sure, to the charge to the commission and its its work. You, as you know, Dave Bruno from Hopkinton is the chair of the commission, <coughs> also vice chair of the House Education Committee. Um, Mel Myler and Jay Pond are also, in a sense, the, 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 the three the three of them are uh, providing some leadership to the commission. Uh, Dave's on the official title of the vice chair. Um, so back to uh, what I was saying a, a few minutes ago, starting last spring and summer, um, Mel and I started talking, and I offered to Mel initially just simply the support by New Hampshire listeners because it felt to me like what would be important would be to be sure there's a strong public engagement component to this effort this time around. Let's hear from folks across the state, um, not just people inside the Concord Beltway, but from people all across the state about their concerns, their hopes, and their, their uh, aspirations for how the state might address in a sustainable way, this uh, school funding challenge. Um, and, and eventually, um, once the commission was established, uh, Mel and Dave sat down with me and asked that if the Carson School would be able to, in a sense, staff the commission using some of the appropriation that the legislature made by the Educational Trust Fund um, to uh, contract with uh, outside uh, school financing experts, people who've done this work at the national scale, <coughs> and to um, uh, support the costs of uh, a real, uh, fairly intensive public engagement process in the coming months. 
also provide support around communications to make sure that the work of the commission is transparent and accessible. <coughs> and there's a way for the public to have input into the commission's deliberations. And we're also supporting the logistical side of the commission as well, scheduling the meetings and technical stuff um, as well. Um, the timeline is at the top of the back of the one of the one big here to go. Um, the commission right now is is reviewing uh, you know, the prior efforts to address this challenge. Uh, we're hearing from um, state agency uh, direct, bureau directors, um, program directors, getting our um, arms around the data resources that are currently available and, and also what's missing, of course. Um, and so the commission, I'd say, is in a Alan James will speak to this, is in a significant kind of input mode right now. And uh, currently, the commission is spending time to um, define the problem. And you might think that, gee, the problem's pretty clear. It's, you know, uh, isn't, it, isn't it well known? And doesn't the, legis the statutory charge define the problem as well? <clears throat> and on the one hand, yes, that's true. But we want to be sure that the 16 members of the commission have a shared understanding of really what it is we're, we're, we're about here. And yes, we can look at the statutory language, we can look at the court decisions. Um, but I would say that part of the conversations in the commission right now are, is our, our current statutory definitions of adequacy, do they really reflect the, the needs of the, in, in 2020 and 2030 and beyond? For our, for our school students. And a lot of you, of course, play really important roles in expanding the notion of what we mean by public education. It's not just seat time you know, spread, as I've been for years. And so it goes on inside schools and outside of schools. Um, it's, it's the relationship of our students to local businesses and employers and giving our students opportunities before they leave high schools to have real work, real, uh, work experience to get connected to two-year colleges, to four-year colleges, uh, so that post-secondary aspirations can be fulfilled. Uh, and schools now are responsible for a larger set of needs besides mastering those skills needed to pass standardized assessments and get into post-secondary institutions. But particularly, we know that uh, the behavioral health needs and social-emotional needs of our students are a part of the school's responsibilities and mission. Now, whether they ask for that or not, or whether they're legislatively charged with that or not, that's what they're dealing with six and a half hours a day, 180 days a year, but really 24 hours a day, 365 days a year in terms of the students' lives. So we're, the commission is, is right now both um, looking at the, our information that's available in New Hampshire, um, reviewing the prior uh, legislative uh, committees, commissions that have addressed this problem, and beginning to get into a kind of a design thinking process that begins with what's our definition of the problem, what do we know about the problem, what have been the past efforts to address the problem, and then we'll, we'll go deeper around these topics. We'll be um, releasing an RFP shortly um, uh, to national uh, school financing and adequacy experts. Those are names that are all familiar to you. There are about a dozen of these firms around the country that do the work. We're targeting those um, with our RFP, and we'll be contracting with them to uh, work with the commission uh, between now and, and, and roughly in August to produce analyses that help us understand how other states address this problem, um, what, are, what are some potential uh, uh, policy options, legislative options, uh, funding options within New Hampshire, uh, given our, our circumstances and how other states have addressed this challenge. Um, by the end of the summer then and into the fall, the commission, I think, will begin to shape and put some parameters around potential policy recommendations. We'll want to take those out to the, to the state, to the public, and hold conversations around the state um, in, in regional sites. Um, to hear from the public, to share with the public what the commission is doing, what it's arriving at, and then to hear back um, uh, general public responses to that. And as I say, then, right now, the, uh, assuming that a particular piece of amendment, amended legislation will be passing shortly, um, the, due, the due date for the commission's report back to the legislature 
will be December 1st. Um, it was the legislation said September 1st to be on the list. So we we'll push that out a little bit. Uh, the commission has a website on the, on the Answer General Court website. We are uh, building a, a separate website at the Carson School um, that will have links to resources and studies and the commission's work and the FAQ page um, and uh, uh, a, a, a Qualtrics kind of input portal so that we welcome comments from the public about this topic and about their views on it. <coughs> so there will now be an opportunity for communication back into the commission as well. We also, at the bottom of that page, we have an email address. Anybody can send a note or a comment or a question to that email address. It'll come to Carrie and Jordan and me, and we'll be sharing that, all of that back out of the commission. So I don't know uh, sort of what the, what the interest is out there as this gets things so, up. So I apologize for um, taking that much time to get it started, but I wanted to get you oriented to to the work of the commission um, and then see what your questions are. <coughs> you know, I, I just mentioned that we are working closely with Richard Meyer. Um, um, I asked uh, Liz in a second talk a little bit about its work so you get the full picture of the effort that's going into this. Education Commission of the States has already been very helpful to us. They'll be connecting uh, with the commission, making a presentation um, a week on its next Monday's meeting. Uh, no, I'm sorry, this Monday's meeting. Yes. Um, uh, and other uh, state agencies that are joining us as well. Uh, and as I said earlier, we'll be contacting the National School Planning Expert soon. Um, so before I ask the list to say a little bit about their work, <coughs> Let me pause and ask, are there any questions that you have for them? What the, what the Carson School will be doing and what our work is? With the Commission of Time on Funding, so. Thank you. Um, in addition to looking at sort of the definition of adequacy, I presume that the Commission will be looking at the true cost of adequacy as a current, currently stands on the current statute. Will the committee or Commission have an opportunity to um, look at the what I'm going to call lack of lack of better break on the under funded mandates that the legislature throws into statutes other than adequacy so they don't have to pay for it. And I guess the sub question to that is is there a way I mean I'm not a social scientist but a researcher, is there a way to ascertain, you know, we know that there are costs to tangible items, feminine hygiene products, for example. Is there a way to ascertain intangible costs? Man hours, staffing, resources, energy spent, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Because from a school board perspective, um, as inadequate as current funding is, um, the reality is since the adequacy formula was last revised or adopted in 2008, they pile more and more mandates on school boards that cost time, effort, resources, materials, and there's a real cost to those sorts of things. So on the first piece that out, do you understand that? Because you know, yeah, I was, I was, uh, first first meeting I was I was attending, uh, the unfunded mandates came up as a, as a something to be considered in the adequacy form because it's it's not really I even going back to the album of the report. I mean it's, it's somewhat in there but not very much. But since then things have changed considerably and even from the last time there was a commission to look at it, there's been such a change in it. The load on school districts, well, educational issues, social issues, everything that's, that's being burdened uh, right now. So I think you're, I, I could almost say, that's the other thing. Yeah, those things too. Yeah, we need to look at everything and, and I think redefine what adequate means, you know, in 2020, yeah. not what it meant in, you know, 1985. So. And, I'll, and I'll mention, as you know, that of course, a um, number of even the elected. Members of the commission also wear other hats in their respective communities. So they was the chair of the school board in Hopkinson. Rick Wyatt has been a school administrator for a number of years. Uh, Iris Estabrook is on the commission. Of course, previously was on the 2008 uh, legislative oversight committee. Uh, so it's, as I said, it's a wealth of knowledge there, and you can be sure that that particular question came up very quickly. On the second one, how to cost the intangibles? Um, we're just thinking. Gary's here catching all of this. Um, when we contract with the um, 
external experts, absolutely like that part of the lesson. Are there questions just about what I provided? And we'll, um, I want to hear back from you all. So let me just comment on, on the question about the minimum standards. Um, at, at our little project before the start of this legislative session, we were talking about having a bill um, in, in the legislature this session that would require the Department of Education to cost all its minimum standards. That has never existed. And that's been a problem where the minimum standards are much higher than what adequate education provides for. We decided not to put that in. Uh, we had sponsors for it, but we decided not to put it in and let this session go. But it would be one of the things that it would seem to me at some point that those minimum standards have to be matched with the other recommendations that would come out of the community. Uh, so uh, I will say that the, uh, the minimum standards did get costed out in the original formula. They came up with a, uh, a methodology far from rocket science uh, to cost out the minimum standards and they ended up with around 3,500 bucks in the in the late 1990s, and it's still basically the same number today, and which is, you know, which is pretty crazy. Uh, I think that the cost at that time, the average uh, expenditure per pupil in New Hampshire was probably in the neighborhood of 7,500 bucks, and today it's like 16,000. So uh, the fact that that number has stayed the same while the, while the, uh, the expenditures for uh, education have gone crazy uh, is, is just Crazy is not the right word. They have, they have increased dramatically. Uh, but uh, uh, um, that, that is, uh, it, it's just wrong. And I don't know how anybody could come to that conclusion back then that they ought to just fund the same number forever. And uh, I, additionally, I want to throw into the uh, uh, mix that, that while I think it's important to, to, to look at, uh, at numbers uh, like, you know, what, you know, what's the, uh, uh, what's, a, you know, what's an adequate education cost today? I do. I, I think that it is, it is worth considering uh, that um, having uh, that there are ways to do this without a uniform mm -hmm. number to be sent to every pupil in the state. And uh, I, I think that, that that we ought to just make sure that we keep an open mind about other possibilities. So that this is one thing. Um, and we're actually going to move right into more of that substance of discussion. As you see, I've got questions here. I want you to respond to what you hope will happen, what concerns, what questions, what you want us to consider as we go forward. Um, and so we'll, that's, that's a, a good appetizer I think, for that conversation. I did want to just see if there are any other questions about the commission itself, how it's organized, what its work is going to be, its membership, anything. In that case, yes, um, yeah, sure. For the work that you all are doing, you definitely can. Sure. All this. So, again, I'm Liz Candido, Director of Policy and Practice at Richie Pryor. Um, for clarification about Richie Pryor, I'm going to read a little bit so that I don't mess up any of the uh, actual language. So, we were established in 2015. Um, we've been deeply involved in supporting and expanding innovation, community engagement, and public education to improve outcomes for all New Hampshire students. Okay. Our mission is to provide, to provide all New Hampshire children with the opportunity to prepare for college, immediate careers, and the challenges and opportunities in life in 21st century New Hampshire. And we do that by serving as a public education policy and community engagement resource for New Hampshire families, students, educators, and other officials. So with that sort of context and framing, um, back in late 2018, um, Reaching Higher prioritized school funding as our leading organizational policy priority for all the reasons why this commission now exists. Um, we believe that re-exploring how New Hampshire funds public schools is the most important policy opportunity in this day and age and for a while. Um, so what are we going to do? I think is the question that uh, Bruce is going to pose to us. Uh, Part of our mission, again, is public education policy and community engagement. So we see ourselves as having the opportunity to do research, um, analysis, what's currently happening. We have some research questions that we're going to have in a few moments. Um, 
pass it over to my colleague Greg to share one that we've been working on for a little bit now, our close to publishing data on. Um, but in depth original research, we recently <coughs> published our whole thing of public education, you know, uh, deep in the weeds of analysis of what's happening in our current K 12 system. Um, today, we put out a community survey on education funding. Um, some of you probably have received it, others are going to be receiving it soon. Uh, we'll be sending it to the entire commission, for example, to help spread the word uh, to get a baseline of how the general public in New Hampshire apply what they know and believe to be true about how New Hampshire funds the schools. Uh, because in order for us to do community engagement and to <coughs> best inform the public and create content, we want to make sure we understand where people are starting from. Mm -hmm. um, so we have research coming up. Um, we've been able to add capacity to our team. Sarah was brought on as a senior project manager for our education funding work. Um, but again, this is where we are putting all of our efforts, for, for the most part, um, is towards the education funding, um, not just the commission, but beyond. We see ourselves as working in parallel with the commission to be able to analyze what you all are talking about on the commission, um, informing the public about what's happening, and with the opportunity to push a little, analyze, and you know, that type of work. So, um, to best move this work forward as we can. Um, we're going to be hosting town halls, convenings around the state to hear from community members where they are now, and also to share how education funding currently works and support. So, probably not surprising if you're already familiar with reaching higher in the work we've done before. Um, and so, what we ask of Sorry, let me take a step back for a moment. If you're not really familiar with reaching higher, it's important to know that we do not um, put out policy recommendations. That is not something that we do. Um, we are not partisan, we are not political. We put out to inform the public. That is what our work is. Um, and so we want to equip the public with as much information as we can in a way that is actually user friendly and can be understood by. Uh, but I say it's a regular human being should be able to understand what we're talking about. And although all of us think about education funding a lot, you might be surprised to find out other people don't. And so we have to be able to give that information to folks so that they understand where we are right now and how it applies to their lives. Um, I mentioned that I'm on the budget recommendations committee in our town. Um, what I know, my partners on the select board, is that the school board and the select board don't really talk so much about what's happening in funding. And so um, that type of information might be helpful in not just reaching out to school board members, but also also to city councilors, mayors, select board members, and so forth in this work as well. Um, so I'm going to pause here to see if there are questions about that before I pass it over to Greg to share a little bit about research that's coming. All right. All right. So I'll, I'll take one or two minutes. So. So you can imagine we have a lot of research questions on this topic that we want to put more meat on. One of them is around the variation in teacher pay across the state. Um, and I think this came out of a couple of things for me personally. Um, one was a couple of years ago, there was an article about the teacher of the year who's an English teacher in Laconia moving over to Wolfboro. Um, and um, one of the reasons for that was that we got an immediate $12,000 bump. Um, the other thing was in testimony last year at the legislature, um, the superintendent of Pittsfield, John Friedman, um, I, I think had some really compelling testimony how, um, if you don't know, Pittsfield's a property poor district, and really how he sees his school district as the JV team for new teachers for two years, and then they move on to other districts that he really can't afford to pay his teachers uh, want to go. Um, and the department, you know, their publicly available data um, have, can give you a flavor of that, but what we're working on right now is looking deeper at, um, I guess for the lack of a better term, salary sub schedules to, to answer questions like, you know, imagine you're a bachelor's degree holder and you've got five years of experience. How does, 
your pay in this district vary with if you went over to here. Or, you know, imagine you're a teacher, you know, with a bachelor's, how many steps or years of experience does it take before you reach 50,000 in salary? Um, to really make it concrete, the hypothesis, which you probably all get with going, there's wide variation in teacher pay, and that can really affect how a district recruits and retains teachers, which I think many agree are the lifeblood of the school to begin with. So, um, more to come on that, but that's just sort of a, a sampling program. So, yeah. Thanks. Any questions? Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I'll, the other side. Educated <laughs> families. My daughter, for many years, was a teacher in Milton. She's a language arts middle school teacher. And she had the opportunity to go from Milton to Deerfield. She didn't have quite that big a loan, but she had that opportunity. And frankly, I think the kids in Milton did that thing. You know, they had a greater need for her great teaching. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have any for me, um, you know, from the point of view of uh, my question is, will it be a starting point when we sort of honestly lay out what the reality is? I, I think there's been commissions going on since 1913, and they are, you know, and I know there's been different um, there's funding that and so forth. But I fear getting distracted by shiny objects without starting first with the reality of how much the state is truly contributing, how much, you know, property taxes are true. Because there's misinformation from many places, and it's not intentional. I think not a lot of the reports you read federally about state contributions to education are misleading because the Hampshire reports to the feds that, you know, we, we spend 20 something percent versus what really is, is going on with property taxes. So I, I guess my question is before we, you know, developing a hypothesis and, and going off on different directions, will there be an honest Sort of layout of what is the state of the state and, and you know who truly is funding what. We're definitely in that work now, and we heard from the commissioner of the uh, Department of Revenue Administration uh, the other day, and that was very helpful in terms of laying out how the money flows in terms of property taxes. And then, of course, Jim Davies at DOE, as understand um, the data that's available there uh, to track that. So. Um, if we're peeling an onion, then we keep peeling the layers back and we want to go as far down into those. I just think that's sort of the step of the starting point. Yeah. To be honest, discussion about what the true reason is. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree with you. And, uh, and what I also think uh, might be worthwhile at some point, uh, hopefully earlier in the conversation, uh, is that uh, we, uh, we consider uh, some. Uh, general principles for how we go about conducting our business. And um, I, I mean, I have a few ideas on, on, on that, but just so that you, and, and then, you know, something to hold up to as you continue to do it. You said, what do you mean by that? By how, what do you mean by how we're conducting our business? How sure, so, so, yeah, so we, we say, yeah, well, how the commission would, so, uh, you know, if, if we made recommendations that, uh, uh, that, for example, that we need to find a constitutional way to get this done. Uh, because too many down the, you know, the, uh, the road, uh, there have been a number of unconstitutional plans that have basically died, and, and the future uh, uh, unconstitutional plans will die too, um, because you're never going to get two thirds of the citizens to, to, to say yes. But so some basic guidelines uh, like that, things that we would be perfectly happy to send to the Supreme Court and uh, I'm sure. and the Supreme and and, and and get their blessing that. Uh, uh, that whatever uh, we had was what the constitution would yeah. I think the answer is yes. I'm not sure exactly how that will happen yet, but I think that as the commission begins to identify potential policy recommendations, they will absolutely want to test those with uh, the Attorney General's Office, Department of Justice. Um, and, and again, I don't know exactly what that would look like, but at advisory opinions or uh, reviews, so that we can almost start to find those in the Michael, I'm going to put you on the spot. If that's okay. It's not the first time you've been on the spot. Lots of times as an educator. Um, 
Can you, will you say a little bit about the charitable foundation's interest and, and yeah. why, why this is important uh, from that point of view? Because uh, you wear a little bit of a different kind of a hat than other so called stakeholders here, so I just wanted to. I think the foundation has long been uh, focused on helping those farthest from opportunity. And I think it's fair to say that um, folks there believe that this is the single most important equity issue in the state. Uh, particularly when looking at those furthest from opportunity, they tend to be the ones who are in districts that have you know, property poor towns, who have less of an access to opportunity, they have less of an access to curriculum opportunities, to extracurricular activities. Um, and I think that we also believe pretty firmly that this is a bipartisan issue, that people on both sides of the aisle should be able to see that this is a critical concern and possibly one of the most uh, important fiscal concerns the state has ever faced in its history. As my friend down the end of the table, Doug, will tell you that this issue has been in the legislature and been litigated since 1919. It's been over 100 years and many different opportunities and has not yet been successfully addressed. Um, and so I think we're interested in that because we think that it's an important equity issue and we'd love to see a, a great resolution so that the kids of New Hampshire all have a fair shot and a high quality education. Good, thank you, thanks. And Val and Jamie might want to comment on this as well, but I'll, I'll go ahead and say that as I hear the commission in its deliberations so far, there is a tension that equity relative to the funding side, um, some equitable, whatever that means, way of allocating resources out to communities that have varying degrees of their own resources. And at the same time, there's a tension to equity for students equity of opportunity, educational opportunity for students. And harder to to maybe measure and uh, understand what the cost portions are, but also equity of outcome. So both inputs um, so that all students have roughly comparable resources in their schools, and therefore all students, no matter what their community or their family income or their Native language might be that there's, there's some equal opportunity in terms of the outcomes uh, when they graduate from high school. Is that a fair description? I, and I think also we can start back. It's not just equal, but equity meaning that some depart, some districts may require more in terms of more resources. If they've had poverty rates, they've had lots of PLL students. And as we stand here right now, I think our most urban districts suffer the most um, and have some of the lowest prison expenditures, um, even though they have some significant need. And we talked about that in starting in the early morning, made up for more seats in the center, so ensuring that equity all the way through the system. So we will, the commission will be taking on the early childhood and pre pre K to understand what even happens with both pre K uh, on, the, on that side, and then also the seats. Uh, system and then it's our connection to the community college system as well, which one of the members is retired president of Manchester Community College. Um, before we get into um, asking you to be a little bit more specific about your hopes, concerns, questions, I want to say a little bit more about the engagement piece of this. Um, one of my asks for you all and the organizations that you represent is to help identify folks that we would like to invite to come together this spring in focus groups around the state. We want to hear from, um, and we'll use the term stakeholders, as opposed to general public. Folks. At this stage in the process, um, so having this kind of conversation that we're having here, but out in eight or ten different sites around the state, focus groups of, let's say, 10 or 12 people, maybe a couple at each venue, so maybe a total of 18 to 20 of those around the state, of school board members and um, school leaders um, and PTO members and students um, and local business leaders, people who, who live and breathe this challenge. Um, and we, that'll be an opportunity again to inform those folks of the commission's work and its charge. And more importantly, to hear from them. What do you want the commission to be paying attention to? How do you define the problem? Um, what does this look like on the ground for you? Um, and so the sites will be, and we'll be working with Reaching Higher because of their 
uh, community based work as well to identify where those sites might be around the state. And I'm envisioning, I'm hoping that those will happen in April and May uh, before the end of the school year. Um, and I'll be back in touch with you um, later on about recruiting and inviting folks to be here. These are not going to be come one, come all. These will not be a, a general call because we, that's not, we're not ready for that yet. But we would like to have a, a good representation of the kinds of people that live and breathe public education every day. Um, and I will, I will say that this one includes charter school folks, public charter school folks, um, as well as um, I certainly think it's important that you know we have these sort of smaller focus groups with the diagram specifically with this every day. Um, and I don't want to put the I don't want to I don't want to put the commission in a in a position where it's pushing for lack of a better phrase, a political policy. Um, but we talked a minute ago about, you know, does that mean with the survey that Liz is going to be sending out? Does the average voter understand this? Mm -hmm. I think if we, if, and again, I want to be mindful of, of your role as somewhat being corporate neutral, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Right? impartial is what I'm Impartial, mm -hmm. certainly. Um, if from, from an educator stakeholder standpoint, if we want to move the needle on this, I think we need to be giving credit to John, Doug, and Andy Polinsky for doing this the last couple of years. We need to get the budget committee members, we need to get taxpayer right association groups who, who look at the bottom line and may or may not have a firm understanding of why their school district budget is so high and why their property taxes are going up every year. Um, and I think this is an opportunity, again, for the work that John, Doug, and Andy have done with this commission. To, to get the voices of those people and hopefully get them a little bit of a better understanding as to why as to why we're facing these issues and why local property taxes are so high. Thank you. That's all right. And if I could add to that, uh, the, the vast majority of taxpayer groups do not exist in towns where you pay up those taxes. Sure. Uh, and, uh, and if uh, and if uh, if we can uh, clearly make a case to them that things have been unfair to their towns, then uh, I do think it, 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 we can make this nonpartisan. And I think they have a statewide organization. At Mail, isn't that? I think there's a, a, a New Hampshire I've been actually looking to see if I can find And they've got a little sort of, you know, affiliates in towns. And if you could send me um, I'll, I'll any some information about that, that'd be great. Um, and then the other group that we want to hear from, hopefully before the end of the school year, which is you know rapidly coming up to us in fashion, fashion that don't believe, although I was at you know, elementary school this morning, Oyster River, and asked them, so how many more extra school days do you have this year? Like five extra school days. In the winter, there wasn't a winter, but somehow lots of, lots of snow days. But in any case, um, I want to hear from students. I don't think that in the past we've gone to students to get there and for us. And there's an opportunity here for educating our students about the, the, the sort of the policy and structural and governance issues. And I know that reaching higher, we've been doing a lot of that in you know, exciting schools. In fact, do you want to say something about your plans for that? Um, we're just uh, working on developing content that students can better understand the education benefit and how they will be able to engage in that way. So equipping them with that information so that they can plug back in and provide feedback in the yeah. And so we'll be, we'll be asking students to come also into conversation about this, to share their concerns, hopefully, but particularly those that have received this kind of content that reaching higher is designed. And so not once they have some degree of understanding of this uh, complex issue, what does it look like for them? What are their aspirations for their school? Um, uh, what is, what is a, a junior in uh, Berlin or Franklin tell us, and a uh, junior in Concord and Hanover? Enforcement to us. And again, um, ground truth, I think, a lot of this work because the, all of the reason that we're here at this table is because of our students, right? It's not because of the associations or the jobs, it's because of the students who we represent. Bruce, uh, I, I'm not sure if this is an appropriate time, but I, I think it, it connects to engagement. Yeah. Um, so if engagement really is critical, I'll just share with you that. So my job is to attend these commission meetings, and I'm having a very difficult time 
scheduling the commission meetings because they, they're not announcing or they're not announcing the dates or the times until a week before. Okay. Um, so I know that you know, the last meeting they published the dates for the next four meetings, but there are no times for South Coast okay. There's no locations. Mm-hmm. And it's my job to attend these meetings and I'm having a hard time scheduling them. I'm canceling meetings and mm-hmm. shuffling meetings around. If I'm a parent, uh, if you really truly want to get engagement, you have to publish a calendar a month in advance with the dates all lined up, the locations, the times, so that people can plan uh, to come and give input or to just listen. Uh, I just leave it at that. I totally I appreciate it. It's critical to engagement. The, the commission will be meeting at this point every Monday, generally 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock. The two that um, uh, these morning meetings will visit the commission member schedules. Um, so, uh, March, let's see, uh, March 23rd, is that one? Right and, and 16th? Great, pull that up. But anyway, uh, yes, point well taken. Thank you. We're also moving the location, at least on a trial basis, moving the location of the meetings to the uh, Business um, and Economic Affairs Office at 100 uh, North uh, Main Street, um, simply because it's a more of a setting like this than the formal public hearing setting. Behavior shifts when they're in a little less normal setting. And the idea is to really enter into a deliberative process with it, not just a, a, a testimony kind of presentation um, culture. Um, so the next meeting is on March 9th, which is a Monday, 2 to 4. Then March 16th, which is also a Monday, 2 to 4. And then the March 23rd is a Monday, and that one's 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. And then beyond that, uh, uh, the following two Mondays, the 30th and then April 6th, are also Monday to the 4th. Right. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're setting up our RC website, and so that will link to the commission's website, which has all the agendas and the meeting minutes. They're working on it. There's, a, there's, one yeah, person, there's one person, so no. So just to reiterate, so uh, the only as of now, the only yes. upcoming meeting that's not two to four is the 23rd, which is 10 to 12. But we don't have a location for that yet, or is that? Uh, well, right now, it's slated to be at the BEA, the Physical Rock Affairs Conference Room going forward. Um, for some reason, it doesn't work in terms of technology or something like that. We you know, may have to rethink that, but right now, that's the plan. Thank you. It's just to clarify. Uh, those times and dates are we talking about this week? No, the commission. Those are all commission meetings. Those are public meetings. Those are open meetings. And this this group is a list for today. It's a, it's. I I don't have any plans for any you know, this group having a particular structure or role. Um, each of you, um, I'm sure, will be asked to come share your ideas with the commission, representing the organizations, whether it's the council on uh, business and education. Uh, or, or others that are, that are here, Jane, of course, are these special education folks. Um, but this this was just my effort to try to make sure that all of you heard the same thing at the same time um, and were ready when I then follow up with you in the future to talk to you about working with the commission, doing outreach in terms of engagement. So, um, do you have any questions? Oh, yeah, sorry. It's on your hand going on. No, I, I was uh, sharing with this gentleman's uh, confusion by this. Is, I, I'm not an invitee. I thought this was part of the you know, commission as far as public oh, So um, I'm here. You know, the agenda, so I was quickly going through the video and heard, you know, the meeting date, you know, down here. So, you know, thank you for letting me attend. But, um, but yeah, it is kind of challenging. I'll, I'll vouch for you, Jim. You know them. You know them okay. <laughs> yeah. On the uh, public engagement, uh, so do you, do you foresee uh, a broader uh, public engagement? Like yes, on? right. So that's the second phase. Yeah. Um, as the commission begins to sort of hone in on some options and has a lot of information to share about that, starting in the fall, in, in September, we'll be holding um, all call community conversations around the state, at least a dozen different locations. Those um, will be facilitated by you know, folks that New Hampshire listens trains. We'll do small group facilitated dialogue. I can envision um, a high school um, cafeteria or gymnasium or community center um, or a large public library room 
hopefully we'll have 100 people show up uh, for uh, Saturday morning or weekday evening for up to three hours to really dig into this topic and then collect the input that we get from those conversations. <coughs> we'll transcribe those, we'll analyze the themes that come out of that, feed those back to the commission in terms of what we're hearing out there as the commission begins, as I said, on its recommendations. So those are the kinds of things. Some of you I know have been in the kinds of work of, of community conversations that New Hampshire Listens has done in the past. Um, they're a way to um, uh, really ask people to um, share their core values, to look at data, and to think about potential solution, preferred solutions to it, whatever the problem at hand is. Really you know, around the opioid crisis, around youth engagement, around um, water, around transportation, uh, public education, of course, around the state. So that's the that's kind of what we want to make sure that we engage with the first day. I'm sorry, I'm still talking about engaging students. I think that's connected with that. I think there's a subcategory which I think would be very compelling. And we heard this at um, some of our community meetings. Um, and one of my colleagues in the legal work is a living and articulate example of this. And that's to talk to recent graduates of some of the property poor schools have them tell the story about what it was like for them to go to college and how much they learned about what they missed and what they hadn't been given. Um, that's, that's, that's very compelling. In some ways, some of the students that might come have, haven't had that experience they realize what they missed. Yeah. Okay, so hopes, concerns, questions. Um, I've got three, uh, you know, what do you hope will happen as a result of the work? What concerns do you have that you want the commission to keep in mind? And then what questions do you think would you like to answer for your constituencies? Um, at least at this early stage. And what we'd like to do is collect those and then, and then have a way of responding back to you. Not, not tomorrow or you know, next week, but over the next month or so. And then what else would you like the commission to consider? So I'm going to ask you to do, actually, and we've begun to... Um, Portion of some of this. Take a couple of minutes to just jot notes to yourselves around those questions. And then I'm going to ask you to go around the table and hear from you about those questions. And also invite you to send those to me um, after today's meeting, because I'm sure we'll talk lots more than we have today just in the conversation. But I want to um, raise that as a so. Took a few minutes. The mission's been for you know, some of the exercise, but yes. Uh, but you can have different ones. Yeah. <laughs> you can use my phone to have a different one. Thank you. There, so I don't know what you have lost to say here. Oh, I'm going to hear that. 
You can hand them to me. Yeah, but I'm also going to ask for sure. Okay. Verbal and public. Okay. And while we're doing that, um, I just got a nice email from Rogers. Rogers, I'm glad that you can hear us. I'm sorry that the technology, for whatever reason, doesn't work both ways. I um, hope that's not a metaphor for anything. But Rogers sent me a nice email. Just to let you know, I'm on the call. But for whatever reason, you can't hear me. Uh, and, and Roger also wanted to know, Rogers, um, that in terms of the kind of resource he is to the state and, and potentially to us, if you saw you know this, he was an assistant secretary of education in the U.S. Department of Education a few years ago. So Rogers has deep um, experience and connections in the United States as well. So Rogers, I'm uh, glad that you sent me that note. I'm glad you came to us. And uh, I'll have a chance to hear from you directly when Tim and I get together. So I capture your thoughts. As well. So I'm going to just look through a round robin here, and so I'm going to ask that we not um, get into a discussion about each of these, and ask each of you just simply to share. First, uh, what do you hope will happen as a result? Let's just capture that and listen to each other. Um, I think that in, in itself will be interesting. And we'll do the second question and the third question. And that will be closed with what else you want us to be sure we're considering as we get started. So, who'd like to start on that first one? What do you hope will happen as a result of the commission's work? I'll start. Please. <laughs> I'm going to play one. For sure. I want to know that we're going to treat everybody the same. Uh, that we will not uh, uh, fund, that we will fund, uh, uh, that we will talk about a, a, uh, a constitutionally uh, sound plan that does not unfairly burden the citizens of the city. And I say that uh, that treat everybody the same part uh, because that's not what we've done. That's not what is in the natural law now. Okay. I mean, my hope really is that what comes out of this is a uh, unified set of recommendations from the commission as a whole. I think for me, that's what's really important given the work that's being done. Um, it's at the end of the day when that report moves forward, that everyone that was on the commission is really behind those recommendations as a united front. You don't want 16 minority reports? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 One step. Beyond the recommendations for all districts to be financially equipped to support all of their students. Uh, three things. Number one, quality education for all the students. Uh, number two, equity um, from the point of view of students. Uh, and number three, equity among taxpayers. And that, that breaks down two subcategories. Um, treating Fairly and equitably with taxpayers um, in one district versus another district, and treating equitably um, one taxpayer in a school district to another taxpayer in that same district. Thanks. I think it's all that's it. <laughs> Equity of education opportunity for the students. Um, and uniformity and, and equality in the tax burden and responsibility of tax burden. Uh, minor, I got three, and they're pretty specific. A new definition of adequate education, what it consists of, and how it was derived. A second, a complete honest listing, costing for schools and districts of different size and student population. And third, mechanisms to raise, that means taxes, and distribute, that means formula, funds that comply with constitutional requirements. Anybody wants to come for theirs? That's not a simple. And I want to let you know, so you can have this as well. 
Um, I'll just <coughs> like, take you about one step. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, I'll just try to do one sentence to uh, develop a sustainable and the underlying sustainable funding formula that has growth levels in effect. Well, my opinion is that that you're sponsoring that's called a conversation in um, real detail, but that the conversation is narrowed by culture or politics or, or whatever, that it's really a, a candy cup for disparities that exist. And I think the um, distribution of how the conversation is is very similar to what folks have already said, it is to, to ensure that we are equitable education opportunities for our kids. Um, a couple other things I think have been mentioned. Um, I think we're going to move more specific on the equity and quality issues, but um, one aspect of the cost of adequate education across all the related mandates that I spoke about before, um, and two final alternative funding sources other than the law. Um, <coughs> no matter where you live in the state, uh, whatever your zip code is, that that the state's giving both our students and their and their communities the chance to give them a high quality uh, public education. Um, um, all right, so reaching higher head over here, personal head. Um, okay. That the true pains that the districts are feeling, you know, so this commission, the current time bell lawsuit, um, is really being driven by fiscal pains in many districts. Um, my hope is that the commission's analysis, the expert analysis, really gets at that a lot of those pains are sort of outside of the control of the districts, that the economy has changed over the last 20 years, the state has downshifted a lot of costs, and it's not mismanagement at the school district level that's really, you know, you just need to make better decisions, but it's these large structural forces <coughs> that are really causing this pain. Um, that's my personal a comprehensive and accurate um, definition and costing of an adequate education without over reliance on the project funds. So um, we could combine all these together and think of a fairly powerful uh, statement of hopes, at least when the folks at this table are again all represent um, some of the key stakeholders in the education community in our state. So I think that was valuable and we'll 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 pull pull these together and summarize these in a way that I think, that I hope, I think will reflect um, the sum total that we said to provide that back to the commission as we go on Monday. Let's, um, what are your concerns? What, what do you see, what are the sort of um, potholes that we should be looking out for? Or um, what, 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 what are you worried about in terms of as this commission gets started? You start I, can, I can start going the other way around. All right. Um, not implying that this is happening, but I guess a concern um, is just to make sure that this is a bipartisan, we've got both parties invested and, and that they see um, that this is, uh, you know, above board, I guess, this process. Yeah, uh, somewhat similar, sort of, uh, that, you know, everything is so polarized right now that. Especially when we reach that point where we're starting to talk about solutions, that the commission has some ability to uh, maybe insulate itself from, what, for lack of a better word, from you know, I mean, what, once those are opened up, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, interests uh, you know, weighing in on that. So, to the extent that they can uh, sort of drown out some of the noise, uh, as as um, maybe that's too idealistic. I'll start with those ideas. Right? Yeah. So. I think I can say this perhaps a little bit more directly than my colleague Brian was trying to say. I'm not worried about being blunt. Um, my greatest concern is that the legislature and the governor, I don't necessarily mean this legislature or this governor, my concern is that the legislature and the governor won't have the rule of reasoning to come up. We won't have reasonable solutions. We'll have a handful of people on board, it will pass constitutional muster, and then the people can hand down the road and it's going to happen again. Down the yellow gate, as it does every goddamn day with a thousand different things. So let me just say that. 
<laughs> you quote me on that. I, I, don't, I don't care. You keep wanting this room. Don't even know I don't care. It is true that, that Carson will be impartial in this. Um, <laughs> we can leave the doctor out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and at the same time, I want to note you know, something, get something different about it this time around. We hope that the public engagement part of this work will create a group of informed and interested folks around the state who will hold the, hold the legislature accountable for the recommendations that go forward in a way that hasn't happened before, whatever those recommendations might be. I hope that that's a, 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 a link in the chain and feedback we get that will be real. That's, that's on us. Don't make that happen. We'll, we'll develop it. A huge database of everybody that has participated in this activities. <coughs> and the commission will be able to communicate with them and vice versa back then. So, again, it's a challenge. My concern was the same political barriers and agendas. Yeah. My concern, I've read all of their calls for I think one of my favorite is um, the, how we figure something out, we get a piece of gone on for decades, we solve it, but then somehow the legislature. <coughs> Does something that just brings us back to the same. I don't know if, if we're currently at the lower funding level from the states we have in you know, the decades past, but whatever happens, it just seems to slide back in. And so it seems like there needs to be something more profound and, and structured that we can do that we want to stay. So that was sustainable. Yeah. 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 That's right. Your concern? Well, that's not the thing. One of the concerns that, <coughs> that you know, Fred probably shared this with me too is that the uh, the output is important to keep in mind. So many of these funding formulas are import oriented. But those of us in the business world who are the consumers of the output of the system can give you pretty quick feedback about what's working and what's not. And I think that that needs to be in in the loop here because you can. I think you can get trapped into thinking that if we provide this education, they will do a good job, and that's not necessarily the case. So, um, and there, you know, there've been a lot of recent studies showing you know. In, in, at least in higher education, you know, administrators of higher education will say, you know, ninety percent of them say we're preparing our students perfectly for the, you know, work in the twenty first century. And you talk to the business people, and ninety percent of them say these kids aren't worth, you know, the space they take because they don't know how to. Work. So there's, you know, there's, you know, those sorts of issues. There's a lot of yeah, finger pointing going on. But the higher ed folks also say. If those high school students would just come to us, well, it, 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 it's, 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 there's a long circular point, and you, you know, point in general here. Your they, system, say, the parents will do their right. job. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah, well, I think we've all seen that part too. Yeah. Right. So, but I think I think we need to get all those inputs um, and not just just focus on on uh, financial input and say, okay, that'll solve all the problems. The money money doesn't solve all the problems. So there's just a lot more involved in than just the financial aspects. Good, thanks. Welcome to Senator Cohn. Um, thanks for taking a few minutes. That we're going to wrap up here in a few minutes, but glad you're here and see you the first time. I was on my way up. What concern do I want the commission to keep in mind? I would hope throughout that they would pay attention to all the court decisions and not operate as if those decisions don't exist. I, I want to go back to the question about bipartisanship and and making sure that the legislature and the governor pay attention to whatever the commission does. And I've been around enough to see what often happens with study commissions is the committee goes over here and does its work, and then the report comes back and most people in legislature haven't paid that much attention to it. They look at see what names are on it and jump to conclusions about what it says or doesn't and don't even dig into the issue. But I guess I think in terms of you know what Mike Kimmel was saying about bipartisan the, the possibility, the hope of getting bipartisan support for big change. I, I'm optimistic about that. Because the facts are there. There are lots of R districts and lots of D districts that really get hammered by the current system. And if if the commission can keep maybe sending little bullet points or things to the legislature, here's you know, here's what we learned last week with some, you know, information that will make sense and appeal to legislators so that they don't just they hear nothing for 
months, a year, and then they get the whole thing. But I mean, I think people need to, you know, and my bias is always on the tax thing, but if people can see in, in the R districts and the D districts how badly the system treats them, if legislators can see that, that, that will help make the whole thing better. Okay. Um, well, I'll allow them up really quickly. Number one, money's a means to an end. And of course, the end is like quality education. Money isn't necessarily the solution, but it often really helps. And I also think lack of money is the problem. Uh, secondly, that um, public resources are not unlimited. And what we are engaging in is to put it bluntly a matter of ratio income. How much money are we going to spend for education? How much money are we going to take from the taxpayers, some of whom are quite wealthy and some of whom can barely get by without um, having to pay their real estate taxes? Um, just uh, which then gets to um, do we want to increase or restructure how we raise the money? Uh, which then leads to the question, well, is it one of those tax the third rail that we want to touch? And uh, lastly, I have a concern uh, about the unfunded mandates, which I think lead into so much of what we're talking about, because those unfunded mandates do um, create uh, costs for school districts that make the issue of school financing in general more difficult. And um, people often characterize unfunded mandates as uh, well, they often characterize the tradition of the funded mandates, uh, or an often ignored prohibition, um, as um, helping towns better predict what, um, how, how they can structure their budgets. But I think there's something much more important. Uh, I think it gets to the heart of democracy because unfunded mandates are saying that an upper level of government cannot impose a, um, a burden on a lower level unless the upper level is willing to take the political heat uh, by great taking, taking the blame for raising the taxes uh, when they're taking the credit for the program. Yeah. 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 So I note that we're getting close to five o'clock. Uh, respect your time, but let's continue with this and then wrap up the talk, please. Um, we've talked about the partisanship of legislature and government, all of these things. I think even before that, is that potentially communities, there are some communities in the state that might feel that they're going to lose something in whatever changes. That that then affects how um, elected officials are engaged with and so forth. And so really keeping in mind that, of course, we always talk about our frequently discussed communities but that there are communities that might feel like a change would harm them and so that's in reality um the other part is beyond unfunded mandates there are intangible items that affect what happens in the school adverse childhood experiences trauma informed care social emotional and then there are parts that are social workers and counselors and special ed um, educators all of those things too but there are parts of the students experience that cannot be quantified in that way to go on a spreadsheet. I love myself some spreadsheets, but there are some things that you can't see dollar amount of, but you need to be talked about in the I think mine is similar to this is a bit, and that is, you know, one of the concerns I have is how to ensure that the commission is really looking at the nuances of some of these um, cost parts of, the, of the, what it takes to run a school or what it takes to meet the students' needs given whatever shows up on your doorstep. Um, I think there's a lot of nuance between the current situation with public charter schools, special education, what stays in district, what needs to be in district, how all of those things, you know, flow out. And I think as a result of that, another concern I have is I want to be clear about the fact that a lot of it is funding formulas and all of that, but it is personal for many people. I have had in front of me in my office a parent of a student with significant special needs and their neighbor who has lived with their entire life who has to um, because of that person's child. And I don't want to lose sight of the fact that without some sort of resolve to this, those are the situations that are causing the communities. And I think it, it does trickle to what Liz was saying to you, the way people interact in the community and what people are willing to include as a 
you know, true, diverse, inclusive community. So I, I don't want to lose sight of the personal part of it, even though there's so much benefit from um, sort of, you know, you know, just keeping it clean and as a learning issue. So I'll make sure that we don't forget that. Jim? Um, I, I think the, I, I hope that the commission has the will to recommend funding outside of the process. Because I don't, I don't think whoever is in the Senate or whatever, I just think the property tax issue um, with the state um, downshifting the cost of the last 10 years on the local municipalities, um, it, it, it sort of doesn't matter whether it's growing or, or, or a wealthy community that to spend sort of on a year. And I think many of you have reference that the commission has reference. We certainly don't want our taxpayers on fixed incomes, you know, not supporting schools. I was very interested in a person from Lyme. He even spoke at one of the commissions, and it's certainly not a time on anyone's radar, right? To have the elderly, you know, describing that conflict uh, between folks that are retired on fixed incomes, not wanting to support schools in general because of the taxes. And you see them in, in wealthy communities as well. Um, of course, for example, you know, it, it's very, you know, I, I'm not even going to go there. I'm not even going to go there. Go there. So, but, but the increased value of the real estate in Portsmouth is a wonderful thing, people would think. But if you're on a fixed income, uh, the only way you're going to realize that increase is if you sell it or your heirs are going to you know, benefit from that. So you have a population that seemingly is under your radar and, and you know of course you would be concerned about that but yet the reality is with an increase in value and an increase in tax so this over-reliance on the property tax is a real challenge everywhere for every community in the state and i think if this commission um wants to make change it has to have the the, the, the understanding that it, it Another source and, and be creative in, in attempting to come up with solutions that the legislature can address. Uh, so, um, um, no Mickey Mouse formulas like the current, like the current law, um, and we're not going to be able to be all things to all people. Um, Whatever formula, tax structure we use, everybody's going to pay the same. The money has to get sent to Concord, like every other tax. And then Concord will distribute the money, like it does with every other tax. Um, and I do have concerns. Uh, that we, that we need to be careful about starting uh, a divisive, politically charged funding war across the state. Thank you. Thank you. I was thinking, thinking about the, the sort of misinformation about the NIH money and the, and the education trust fund. I mean, so clarity about that, and I think, is, is really important. And what is the burden that's supposed to go into the education trust fund to other uh, agencies that, um, you know, are funding the other public uh, education so I think there's, there's a great fear, and there's a lot of, um, I'll tell you, the public school system is a lot of fear about people speaking and being honest. So I think, um, you know, really laying out the data there's a lot of information we're not aware of as far as funding to private and charter schools and so forth. But I know in special ed, um, we're, we've lost catastrophic aid, we've lost um, 402 charter school money, the commissioner has changed the federal money, so now the federal money is going to follow children to a city that the child is in to go to school. So, I mean, it's it's a million little cuts that it's making it very, very difficult to keep our money on water. Um, and I just think that clarity and honesty is all the so there's one we go about the education trust fund that hasn't been on there like this. It is now. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. It's, again, this is this has been very helpful to us. I think there's as, as we build out the calendar and the topics uh, that we want to dig into. There's one other question. Um, 
talk about this a little bit. <coughs> so we use the phrase unfunded mandates and the downshifting of costs. Is there going to be talk about some funding that the state has never funded? I mean, they've never funded the gas drop. Um, you know, as we know that they've got rid of building aid, you know, by my, by my calculations, the state owes us a couple billion dollars. <laughs> Right, yeah, two hundred fifty million dollars for ten years. That's a lot of money. Um, and and the retirement cuts have been catastrophic on on school district budgets as well too. For the state top money for retirement. So there will absolutely be opportunities for kind of direct testimony, yeah. direct input to the commission from those of you that are at the, at the table now. In any case, and, and we're capturing this today as well as kind of a foundation sure. for the commission to pay attention to and build out that. Build out that calendar and also design the kind of engagement work that I described earlier as well. I'm sure all of those interests. So, um, in respect to your time and my time, um, and we have just two other questions at the bottom here. What questions would you like answered? And then what else do you want us to consider? And if you to consider, I'll simply invite you to um, send me that uh, via email. You have that contact because I can communicate with you via email, or you can use our fancy brand name. Uh, commission email at the schoolfunding.commission at unh.edu. We'll be collecting all of that. And this is the beginning of a significant process to collect input from you, your constituents, and the broader public as well, and students, you know, as we get as we get going here. So thanks again for your time this afternoon for your thoughtfulness. Um, and I think that you know, every time we're going to have a uh, excuse me, a conversation like this can demonstrate that there's a constructive and civil way to do this, whatever our various perspectives are on how to solve the problem. So that's Bruce, is there going to be another that. meeting with us? I don't have one plan, but we're building this plan as we're talking. <coughs> and so if you all say to me, you all want to get together again, we you know, yeah. 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 should remember I appreciate all the information we're getting out of the proverbial grizzly from the fire hose. Um, <laughs> I, got, I got a stack of you know, court rulings this thing would have cut. Um, you know, it's, it's very, very beneficial for, for me, certainly, as one of the members to, to hear all the input because we're trying to come up with, you know, something that satisfies all of us. We only keep doing these commissions every couple of years, you know. We'd like, like I said, sustainable would be nice. So the benefit we have now in today's world is we have a lot of data that we can analyze which is much more than we've ever had in the past. So I hope our decisions become data-driven uh, because they become less controversial. It's not opinion-driven. We have data that backs things up and it sort of guides you in a certain direction. So the more information we have, we have things like, you know, the, the reason you hire analytical models in place now that can help us churn a lot of this information and get some insights that we would have never been able to get otherwise. You know, right now we're in the data collection mode. It's, it's very important to get the information. There's a, a request that I think is reasonable to uh, at least have on the table for groups that collect a lot of information over a long period of time, like many of the people here, uh, that uh, court decisions, for instance, are probably 400 pages of documentation that we have currently. Uh, statutes would be another few hundred. My point in saying this is that uh, maybe there are summaries, and I recognize that when we start to get into the summaries, it's your bias as to what was important to put into the summary. But those summaries can be circulated to other people who have expertise and uh, experience. Uh, I would ask that uh, we not rely on the commission members to be experts in every statute and every court case and every funding formula, but to understand in summary what those things are uh, to people who do watch this. Uh, and perhaps uh, a, a, a temporal or time period that maybe has elapsed school funding or maybe has elapsed or catastrophically has elapsed for you know, a couple of decades. Uh, so, Understanding those contexts, because sometimes things get broken. But I don't need to dwell on the general request, which is, I think we need to have a mechanism for when we engage an audience like this. Uh, it's not one way, but we seek something back from them. Right. Yes. Yes. Sir.
Because there's no such thing as a free lunch. Are you? Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Yeah.